Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for choosing to come again for our Bible study on the topic, Can You Trust the Bible? Let us pray as we begin. Gracious Father, we thank you for bringing us together again as we open your word, open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, um, this is the outline. Today we are looking at part four. Does science disprove the Bible? And this is very important as it is. Many people think science and Bible do not, they contradict a lot. But what is the relationship between science and the Bible? This is a question many people ask. Look at the worldview, what the worldview is. The world says, Hebrew scriptures has no bearing on the modern study of the physical world or on the other way around. Bible and science belong to wholly separate domains of reality. The Bible pertains to the sphere of morality and spirituality. Science, by contrast, has dominion in the realm of physical things. You, you, do, you, do you see how the world view is? world is saying that uh, they both are separate. You can't bring them together. They say religion is purely pertains to morality and spirituality, whereas science is in the realm of physical things. So they both don't go together. In other words, they're saying that Bible has nothing to do about physical things. It only speaks of morality and spirituality. That's the worldview. What about biblical view? Biblical view says science is a way of knowing and exploring God's creation. Science encourages students to use their senses to observe and understand God's world. That's biblical view. Biblical view doesn't separate science from the spirituality. Neither does it deny the evidence of science. That's the biblical view. But the world thinks otherwise. Okay, let's look at some of the uh, things about whether the Bible and the science go hand in hand or not. For example, the Earth's free float in space, what does it mean? 1500 years before Christ, many people believed that the Earth sat on a large animal or a giant. However, before science discovered the truth in 1650, the Bible already spoke of the earth free floating in space. In other words, until 650 AD, people had this concept that the earth is sitting on something. You can't think of something floating somewhere such huge as it is. Only in 1650, science discovered it's actually not sitting on anything. But 1,500 years before the science could come to this conclusion, look at what the Bible says, Job 26.7. We believe even according to the scholarly and thing, Job is one of the oldest books, in the oldest book of the Bibles written even before Moses could write or during time of Moses. And some believe it may be probably Moses who wrote it. Anyway, what does the Bible say about this? He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth upon what? Nothing. Look at 1500 years even before science could come with this theory that actually the earth is not hang, hung on anything. Bible already said it. He hangs the earth upon nothing. So you see how it is related. And next, what about the circle of the earth? If you see, if you go through the scientific evidence, so many theories about what is the shape of the earth. They said it was flat. It was the Greek philosopher who first concluded that the earth was round. When? Around 500 BC. Before that, everybody believed the earth was flat. Remember, you go on a sea, you see everything flat. They, you can't see a circle. Anywhere you see, you can't see a circle like thing. So it was the belief of those, those of those days, scientists and philosophers that the earth was flat until these people, Aristotle and Aristotle and Pythagoras all wrote about this theory as early as 
500 BC. But look at what the scripture says. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. This was written, Isaiah was written around 700 BC. So at least 200 years before man could think that the earth is round, Isaiah already mentioned through the inspiration that the earth was circle, the shape. That's why he said, he who sits above the circle of the earth. So that's what you see. Now, another few more things. I don't know if you have heard of this. Uh, um, what's this? Matthew Fontaine Maori. This, this, this plaque is there right now. This is a monument erected by the state of Virginia to his memory. He's a founder plaque that reads as follows. Matthew Fontaine Maori, pathfinder of the seas. That means he's the founder of the path in the seas. The genius who first snatched from the oceans and atmosphere the secret of their loss. This is this is what they did. But let's see his theory on oceanography, what he actually is, happens. Now look at this. The Bible and the science of oceanography, Matthew Maury, is considered the father of oceanography. He is considered. He lived in nine, uh, 18th century, 8th to 6th to 8th, 7th. He noticed the expression, paths of the sea in Psalms 88. If you remember, Almost all scientists in 18th, 19th, most part of 20th century are all Christians. They were inspired by Bible to discover more. What they read in the Bible, they want to see if this is true by observation and experimentation. So this man, he read Psalms 8, 8. Where, what does it say? It talks about paths of the sea. In other words, there are certain pathways in the sea. That's what the Bible, what does it mean? Psalms was written almost 2,800 years ago before his time. And when he read it, he said, if God said there are paths in the sea, I'm going to find them. He wants to prove if the Bible said was right or wrong. He said, okay, Bible says there are paths in the sea. Let me see if I can find them. So what did he do? He then took God at his word and went looking for these paths. And we are indebted to his discovery of the warm and cold continental currents. His book on oceanography remains a basic text on the subject and is still used in universities. So what does the Psalms 8, 8 say? The birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. He discovered that what the Bible said is true in the sea. And that is in his inspiration to discover the paths in the sea. It was in 18, around 1800. 18th century he discovered, but the Bible spoke of it almost 2,800 years before any man could even think that there are paths in the sea. What about other, uh, look at this one, light waves and radio waves. Science discovered that light can be sent and manifested itself in speech in 1864 by British scientist James Clark Maxwell. This is when it was discovered that light can be sent and manifest itself in speech. Electric magnetic wave, where that is radio waves, X-rays, travels at the speed of light. This is why we can have instantaneous wireless communications with someone on the other side of the earth. Electricity and light waves are two forms of the same thing. This is what the science says. What, what does the Bible say? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. So Job, in, with inspiration around 1500 BC, it's almost over again, 2800 years before, Job spoke about saying that you can pass the message through the lightnings. Say, here we are, they are sending a message. What about the water cycle? You know, Bible and the water cycle. For example, the Mississippi River dumps approximately 518 billion gallons of water every 24 hours in the Gulf of Mexico. So many people, before they understood the water cycle, they used to wonder, so much water is pouring into the sea every day. And yet, 
the sea is not full, yet it is not overflowing. So they had this question, where does the, all this water go? What is happening? If it is one day, two day, we can understand. But every day, 518 billion gallons. Imagine what that means. And yet, the sea level never rises. What's happening to all this water? So they're asking the question, where does all this water go? And that's just one of thousands of rivers all around the world. The answer lies in the hydrologic cycle. The idea of a complete water cycle was not fully understood by science until when? The 17th century. Until 17th century, they could not figure out what exactly was happening. Where is the water going? However, more than 2,000 years prior to the discovery of Fiery, Perrault, Edmund, Marriott, I hope I'm pronouncing correct, Edmund Halley and many others who discovered this water cycle. The scripture has an answer. Ecclesiastes 1.7 says, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, there they return again. What does the Bible say? No matter how much water you pour into the river, sea, the sea is never full. But it also gives explanation what's happening to all the water that's going into the sea from the rivers. What does the scripture say? It says, from whence the rivers come, there they return again. So where is the river water coming from? We know, we have not heard of seas drying up. We have heard of rivers drying up, streams drying up. How do the rivers become full again? The main sea is through rain, isn't it? When there is heavy rains, the rivers overflow. We know that one. So what is uh, uh, the Job saying? The water that comes into the river, from where it is coming, that's where it is going back again, it says. So what we call today evaporation and content, you know, the process of water cycle that science have clearly explained. Bible has said it 2,800 years ago before man could think and understand where is this all this water going that fall goes into the water. Look at another statement. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Ecclesiastes 11.3. Look at the Bible's concise words in Amos 9.6. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the face of the earth. What does it mean when Amos says he calls the waters of the sea? What does that mean? It means the water in the sea gets evaporated, goes, forms into clouds, whatever, then it comes back again. So the water cycle, Bible has it written long before even science could even think what that means. Remember, we are studying does that science, science disprove Bible. The next one is the law of thermodynamics. Now, what does the law of thermodynamics say? First, it was uh, Antoine Lavoisier who discovered this called conversion, the law of conversation of mass. In it, the most compact form it says, and that means we all know this, matter, matter is neither created nor destroyed. This is what we studied. That means you cannot create the matter, you cannot even destroy it. It can take the shape of something else, but you cannot completely, neither you can create nor can you, that's what science says. Then in 1842, Julius Robert Mayer discovered the law of conservation of energy. In its most compact form, it is now called the first law of thermodynamics. It's the same principle which says energy is neither created nor destroyed. And in 1907, Albert Einstein, we know this, they give, they have a question if he said it or not, but I'm not sure. Well, he announced the equation of the or most science students will know this, E is equal to mc square. And as a consequence, the two laws above were merged into the law of conservation of mass and energy. Instead of putting them to separately as a law of matter and energy, they put them together. That's what is called E is equal to mc square. What does that say? The total amount of mass and energy is the universe, in the universe is constant. Same, same thing, it can neither be created nor destroyed. It is constant. That's what it says. What does the Bible say about this? The Bible and the first law of thermodynamics, the scripture says, look at Genesis 1, 2, 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. The main thing here is finished. When God created the entire universe, he said, it is finished. That means what he has to create, he has created. It is done. 
there's no more to add nothing to subtract the original word used in the past definite tense as the verb finished indicate an action completed in the past never again to occur so when he said it is finished it is done is not creating day in and day out the creation was finished once and for all that is exactly what the first law of thermodynamics says it was because of this law that sir fred hoyle's steady state or says theory was discarded he hoyle stated that at point in the universe called eitrons matter or energy was constantly being created but the first law states just the opposite he tried to de deny this fact but most accepted theory is that matter can neither be created nor destroyed that's what scientifically proven so indeed there is no creation ongoing today isn't it is there any creation ongoing today what is already there from that you make for example adam and eve is already created what is happening is man creating man trees creating trees so it is neither created that means it it did not come on its own and neither is it destroyed you can't destroy it it is finished exactly as the bible says thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished what is there it expands it comes but you can't have anything different the bible and the dinosaurs this is another thing many people think oh are dinosaurs real do they have it people named it dinosaurs it <clears throat> what the what what the wikipedia says about dinosaur dinosaurs are a diverse group of reptiles of the clade dinosauria they first appeared during the triassic period between 243 and 233.23 million years ago i don't know how exactly they can come up with this 0.3 million years although the exact origin and timing of the evolution of dinosaurs is the subject of active research they have some figures they just an approximate they think okay look at what actually the bible says about some creatures they are called behemoth which i made along with you and which feeds on grass like an ox look at the qualities what strength it has in its loins what power in the muscles of its belly its tail sways like what a cedar the sinew of its thighs are close knit it bones are tubes of bronze its limbs like rods of iron it ranks first among the works of god it's one of the first creations of god yet its maker can approach it with his sword the hills bring it their produce and all the wild animals play nearby under the lotus plants it lies hidden among the reeds in the marsh the lotuses conceal it in their shadow the poplars of the streams around the raging river does not alarm it it is secure though the jordan should surge against its mouth can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose paul was talking about some animal he named it behemoth and he gives some qualities how to identify it what did he say first of all according to job this was largest of all creatures that was made it was a plant eating it had its strength in its hips its tail was like a large tree it had very strong bones its habits are among the trees drank massive amounts of water his nose pierced through snares all this is what the science says and you can see all this recorded in job chapter 40 verse 15 to 24 while the bible calls it behemoth the science after discovering some bones and imagining or coming to a conclusion that there did exist some large animals and giving it a name dinosaurus and when they try to from whatever the evidence they have when they try to find out its habitat and its life or what it ate and how it looked and what this is what they came exactly with what the bible said nobody has seen this animal but bible discovered it described it and science through scientific observation they believe they had lived in the beginning how many years ago according to them 243 million years ago that's what they come up with but at least they say in the beginning there was an animal like this with this kind of qualities and bible has already said about it another scientific evidence air mass what is it it was recognized that the air had weight when did they discover it in the 16th century the fact that so much water covers the earth means that the effect of the sun 
and moon's gravity are balanced perfectly. The energy is dissipated in the water. The weight of the water is precisely measured. That's what our scientist Richard Gunther come up with. Now, look at what the Bible says. To establish a weight for the wind and apportion the waters by the measure. Again, Job. Job is a fascinating book. For example, look at the picture there. A balloon tied to a scale, one without air and with air. Definitely the one with the air seems to go down, which indicates that air has weight. When did they discover this? In the 16th century. When did Job say it? 2800 years before they discovered that air has weight. The Bible says to establish a weight for the wind. Springs in the sea. This is another interesting discovery. Modern deep sea diving cameras have discovered amazing hot water winds on the floor of the oceans. It's, it's really amazing, isn't it? As you go diving deep into the waters, in the sea, down deep, they have discovered what? Hot water springs in the sea at the deep. These thermal vents release huge amount of mineral-rich superheated water, I believe according to the scientist, with springs in the darkness. They discovered it. Look at this. Spectacular hot springs were then discovered on the Galapagos Rift in the Pacific Ocean by the 23rd foot-long submersible Alvin in 1977. Alvin also explored a photographed and sampled hot springs of the East Pacific Rise just south of the Gulf of California in 1979. They discovered these things. Look at what Bible says again. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the depths? God was telling Job, do you know that there are springs in the sea? Have you even thought about it? Have you even walked in the depths of the sea and discovered what is there? You don't know what. It, in other words, God was trying to tell Job, you think you're smart? Can you know all these things? That's what he was actually trying to say. So, but look, they discovered it. In, in, in which century? 21st century. After all, the almost six, almost how many? 3,500 years before, Job said, there are springs in the sea. God was asking him, do you know that there are springs in the sea? You think you're so smart? Do you know so many things that I have created? The next one is the way of light. In other words, when light falls from the heavens, does it mean it just spreads around or does it have a path? Modern man has only recently discovered that light, electromagnetic radiation, has a way in empty space. This speed is approximately 186,000 miles per second. That's what it travels at. Look at what the bar, bar, again Job says. Where is the way where light dwells? God was again asking Job, do you know how the light travels? Do you know the path of the light? Science discovered it later, but Bible spoke a bit earlier. Bible also speaks about light can be divided. <clears throat> Sir Isaac Newton studied light and discovered that white light is made of several colors. So the white light we see, just not one color. He says it is actually made of several colors, which can be parted from the white and then recombined to make the white again. Science discovered this in 1650 AD. Look at what the Bible says. <clears throat> By what way is light diffused or the east wind scattered over the earth? He was saying how the light can be diffused. What about this? Is that, that's, that's a bit of scientific thing. Look at the Bible, the Bible and medical science. Or, or does Bible and medical science have anything in common? No, we all know this. Information in the blood. You know, any problem nowadays, when you go to the doctor, the first thing that they tell you is what? Let's do a blood test. They're not able to know what exactly is happening. So they suggest let's do a blood test because they know blood contains information. And uh, by that, they will exactly be able to say what's going on in your body. This is now. But do you look at, we all know, that just by taking a blood sample, a doctor can evaluate the health issues. This is what I was trying to say. But uh, look at Leviticus 17.11. 
for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. When God said to sacrifice lamb and pour the blood, he was actually referring to life. And Bible says, where is the life in the flesh? For the life of the flesh is where? In the blood. Our life is in the blood. But before science discovered this, that blood contains life and information, you know what was the belief in the scientific world? For example, bloodletting in 1860, one of only three, this photograph is the original, one of the only three known photos from that time. You know what they believed? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar. To, this is what the Bible says. But you know what is this photo doing? What is this doctor doing? He was, he is what? He was taking out blood. Why? What was it doing? Those days they believed if you have sickness, if you have sickness, one of the treatments they did was they emptied your blood. They took out the blood thinking that the disease is in the blood. And if you read the history, so many people died because the doctors thought by taking out the blood, they're healing you rather than killing. But what happened is many people died. Only later they discovered actually what we're doing is wrong because the life is actually in the blood. What we're doing is we're taking out the blood and killing the people. Bible said it long back. The life is in the flesh. The other for the life of the flesh is in the blood. What about washing your hands under running water? This is very interesting. Look at this. According to scientific discoveries, the Encyclopedia Britannica gave an account of a young doctor. This is in 1850, 1845, who discovered the importance of washing hands. When did he discover that you have to wash hands? 1845. What did he come up across? Hundreds of years ago, a major problem was the death rate among women giving birth in hospitals was high. It was very high, people giving birth in the hospital. Now, why is the reason? In some years, the death rate was 30% of women after giving birth. In centuries past, doctors never practiced washing hands before going to the next patient. They never washed hands from patient to patient. This was because the presence of microscopic diseases weren't yet discovered. So they didn't know that they carry germs from one person to another person. So doctors went and treated everybody. If they delivered a baby here, a woman, they went, they never washed hands, they went and did the same to the other woman. And that's why the death rate, they didn't discover what, what they were worried, why this is so. Only later, because it was not discovered that microscopic disease when it was discovered that washing hands would help stop the spread of disease, that death, the death rate of pregnant women dropped down to 2%. So when they started washing hands, they realized that death rate is coming down. Look at Leviticus 15, 13. Now when the man with the discharge becomes cleansed from his discharge, then he shall count off for himself seven days for his cleansing. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in what? Running water and will become clean. Not just water, running water, because that's the clean water. Bible already said when somebody has a discharge, that means some kind of a bleeding or any other kind of infirmity, he must or she must be separated from people. I mean, he, they, 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 they can only be clothes and bathe in running water to become clean. Can only become clean by running water. The next is quarantine. You know, until this COVID came, I didn't really give much thought to what is this quarantine business. So we have medical science found out about the importance of isolating a person with infectious disease in the 14th century. When? Only in the 14th century, they realized that if you must separate a sick person from a non-sick person. How did they come to that conclusion? They observed almost 17 million lives were taken through plague. Why? And they were wondering what's the main reason? Because they failed to separate the sick from the healthy. It was until the 17th century 
that the loss of quarantine were instigated. That's when they realized, you know what, we have to separate the sick from the healthy. Look at what the Bible says. This again, almost 2,800, 500 years ago. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live what? Alone in a place outside the camp. This is the Israelites. If somebody has an infection, he or she must live outside the camp and they must be separated. What we call today quarantine. The Bible spoke of it long back. The Bible and the fat intake. The American Heart Association says the major kinds of fats in the food we eat are saturated, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, and trans fatty acids. Saturated fats, trans fats, dietary cholesterol, raise blood cholesterol. A high level of cholesterol in the blood is a major risk factor for coronary heart disease, which leads to heart attack. So in reference to prostate cancer, a study by the University of Pennsylvania Cancer Center stated, the fourth most common cause of cancer among men may be related to saturated fat consumption. Saturated fats come from animals, we know that. What does the Bible say? We are told, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel saying, you shall eat no manner of fat of ox or of sheep or of a goat. God knew the harmful effects of eating fat. So he instructed that fat eating is harmful to human body. And he told Moses to tell that they should not touch fat. And yet the science also says, what kind of, when you eat fat, what happens to your body? What about the, the Bible and the correlation of mind and body? Look at this. The medical science have come to understand that there is a strong relationship between a person's mental and physical health. Science have discovered that. The Bible revealed this to us with these statements. 950 BC, for example, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. Trying to explain how a healthy mind can also affect a healthy body. The light of the eyes rejoices the height, the heart, and a good report makes the bones fat. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. A merry heart doeth like a good medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. In other words, there is a there is a relationship between the mind and the body. What affects the mind affects the body. What affects the body could affect the mind. Science say it, but the Bible have been saying it for all these years. This, this slide will show you just a summary of so many things, what the science said before and then they changed. Science keeps changing, we all know that. The Bible said the earth is a sphere. First, the science said the earth was a flat disk. Later, it said the earth is sphere. Science, Jeremiah speaks of number stars that you cannot count. But when science began to study the sky, they said there were 1,100 stars. But now they realize, no, that is wrong. It is innumerable stars. And most of the other things, free float of earth. First, the science said earth was sitting on a large animal. But now they realize it's actually floating. It's not sitting on anything. Creation made of invisible elements. Science was ignorant on the subject. Creation made by invisible elements. Later, atoms that you can't see with your eyes. Each star is different. All stars are the same. That's what the science said first. But later they said, no, each star is different. Light moves. First they believed that light is fixed, but now they believe it moves. Air has weight. First they said air has no weight. Now they believe air has weight. Wind blows in cyclones. Wind blows straight. That's what they thought. But now they know wind blows in cycles, cyclones. Blood is the source of life. What did they do, science? Sick people must be bled in order to save them. Later they realize, no, blood is the source of life and health. Ocean float, floor contains, we studied all this. First science said the ocean floor was flat, but now they know it has valleys and mountains and deeps and springs and all those things. Okay, there's, there's so many, actually there are 101 facts I was reading an article, it's 101 facts and the signs that you can find in the Bible. These are just few, just to give you an idea. 
So what you see is science keeps changing. We all know that even science, what is scientifically true today may not be true tomorrow. As the advancement comes, they realize better methods, better techniques, better understanding, and it could completely change from A to B, or there could be an improvement from A to A plus, just to see. So it keeps changing. When, even when COVID came, look, do you remember what happened? Everybody said, no, you have to do this, you have to do that. You have to get the people onto mask and they killed more people by putting them on the mask. They realized, no, this is not the best method. Then they changed to something else. So there is no straight, clear cut evidence or anything just happens like that. By observation and experiment, they will improve step by step, but just not at once, like how the Bible says, the earth is pure. But the, earth, the science could not say it because they didn't have maybe all the tools and all the knowledge needed to come to that conclusion. So they said it was flat. Only later they realized, no, it's not flat. It is certain sphere. So you see science keep changing day by day, but not the scriptures. It's constant. The scriptures existed even before any scientific theory could come into existence. I just want to share with you, those are some of the evidences of science proving the Bible is right. Let's look at a few statements here. Ellen White says something on this. Since the book of nature, that is science, according to Ellen White, nature is nothing but the book of science. And the book of nature is nothing but science. And the book of revelation, that is Bible, bear the impression of the same mastermind. They cannot but speak in harmony. By different methods and in different languages, they witness to the same great truth. Science is ever discovering new wonders, but she brings from her research nothing that rightly understood conflicts with divine revelation. As much as science, every time they become of this new truth, if they are rightly understood in the light of the scriptures, they don't contradict the book because it's a book of nature created by God. The book of nature and the written word shed light upon each other. They make us acquainted with God by teaching us something of the law through which he works. This is from book Education 129. Another statement. Inference erroneously drawn from facts observed in nature have however led to supposedly, many people have led to supposed conflict between science and revelation. That means because many theories, people have said it in a different ways, people tend to believe that science and Bible are opposites. And in the effort to restore harmony, interpretations of scriptures have been adopted that undermine and destroy the force of the word of God. For example, geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the mosaic record of the creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And in order to accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation were assumed to be to have been vast indefinite periods covering thousands or even millions of years. In other words, science and geology and all, they come up with this idea. The earth, the, the life on earth has been there for millions of years. Whatever the methods they used, they said evolution did not take place overnight. It took millions of years for something to evolve and be what it is now. But when they read the scriptures, Bible speaks of six days of creation. So they can't comprehend how things have just come overnight like that. Re reason is not, they are not able to grasp into their mind if this is possible because by observation and by observation and by experimentation, it takes long time. So what they did now, in order to fit their teaching and not also discredit the Bible because they still believe there's a creator who created this. They came up with this theory, probably, the creation week is not a literal week, like six days or seven days. It could be millions of years. We should not take that literal. We should take it symbolically so that it could they could defend their theory and things like that. This is how things sometimes go. The Bible is not to be, <clears throat> the Bible is not to be tested by men's ideas of science, but science is to be brought to the test of the unerring standards. It is clear, however, that science is an important partner to the Bible in our search for truth. 
True science contributes fresh evidence of the wisdom and power of God. Rightly understood, science and the written word agree, and each sheds light on the other or put another away. Nature is now marred and defiled by sin. But even now, rightly studied and interpreted, she speaks of her creator or as follows. Nature is full of lessons of the love of God. Rightly understood, these lessons lead to the creator. This is what she said. Well, okay, people, if you, you, may, you may not believe science, so let's, uh, Ellen White, so let's put her aside. Look at what actually some scientists are saying. This man is a biologist, Francisco, from the University of California. He says, indeed, if science and religion are properly understood, they cannot be in contradiction because they concern different matters. Science and religion are like two different windows of looking at the world. The two windows look at the same world, but they show different aspects of that world. Science concerns the process that account for the natural world, how planets move, the composition of matter and the atmosphere, the origin and adaptation of organism. Religion concerns the meaning and purpose of the world and of human life, the proper relation of people to the creator and to each other, the moral values that inspire and govern people's lives apparent contradictions only emerge when either the science or the belief or often both trespass their own boundaries and wrongfully encroach upon one another's subjects of matter. Some people are very biased. People, religious people, they may be biased only to see everything through the lens of religion. Scientists could be biased of seeing everything through the lens of science. What he's saying is <clears throat> they both actually don't contradict. One addressing the process in which how things work, while the other is talking about the purpose of this world and the human life. You know, we studied uh, um, last time, does God exist, if you remember? And in that one of our study was, if you, if you happen to not have gone through, go to my YouTube channel, there's seven, seven series of lectures on does God exist? You cannot give evidence of morality, ethics, laws that govern human life without a creator. If it is purely by scientific reasons we exist here, science has no morality or other things. It's an amazing thing. You need to see that one. This is what he's saying. They both don't um, um, contradict. They actually speak of the same thing. Look at this person. William H. Bragg, a British physicist, he, this is what he said. From religion comes a man's purpose. From science, his power to achieve it. This is an amazing statement. Sometimes people ask if religion and science are not opposed to one another. They are opposed. They are in the sense that the thumb and the fingers of my hands are opposed to one another. It is an opposition by means of which anything can be grasped. They are in opposite, but they, if you are to grasp something, you need to use both of them. So he's saying you cannot separate science and Bible or religion because they both complement. They speak of the same thing, but with a different perspective. So we, we have seen how Bible comes next week. Uh, God, where our life, when we come, we will look at does archaeology, does archaeology, disprove the Bible. They have discovered so many things, some say whatever. Let's see if the archaeology has any evidence of the Bible that we believe. So today we concluded does, does science disprove the Bible? No. What Bible said years and years ago science was actually saying now. Science doesn't disprove. If a faithful student of science looks into this marvelous world and look at how did it come and read Bible, they will see Bible actually supports. It doesn't contradict science at all. God bless you all. I hope this will help you to understand God better and this world that he created for us. Thank you, Pastor. Blessings. Oh, how do I... Stop recording. Yeah. Mm -hmm.